So to start off on this lecture, I want to go over a question involving uh, which of the following has the strongest intermolecular forces. And so this is a continuation from the lecture, the last lecture about uh, intermolecular forces. Here we have uh, fluorine, iodine, chlorine, bromine, and nitrogen. Uh, molecules, and we know which one has the strongest intermolecular forces. I'll show you two different ways you can determine uh, which one is the strongest intermolecular forces, and we'll go from there. So here what we have to notice is that fluorine, iodine, chlorine, bromine, and nitrogen are all one particular group of type of compound of molecules. And these molecules are all nonpolar. So fluorine, iodine, chlorine, bromine, and nitrogen, which are all diatomic molecules, they're all nonpolar. So when they're all nonpolar, the main intermolecular force or the major intermolecular force is dispersion or London forces. And so dispersion forces arise from induced dipoles or temporary dipoles that develop due to the polarizability of these molecules. And so the greater the polarizability, the greater the dispersion forces. And the way you get more polarizability is you have more electrons. So you have more electrons, they can become easier to distort. So it becomes easier to distort, it has stronger polarizability, which gives you stronger dispersion forces. And the most common way to determine which one has the most or the greatest polarizability is by looking at the molar mass. So the higher the molar mass, stronger dispersion forces. So if you have all nonpolar compounds and you want to look to see which one has the strongest intermolecular forces, it's going to be the one with the highest molar mass because it has the greatest polarizability, the strongest uh, dispersion forces. So here if we look, for example, fluorine has a molar mass of 38. Iodine has a molar mass of 254. Fluorine has a molar mass of 71. Bromine, a molar mass approximately 180 or 160. And nitrogen has a molar mass of 28. So which one has the strongest intermolecular forces would be the one with the greatest molar mass. So in this case, it would be iodine. Again, when you have the uh, large molar mass, you have more polarizability, which leads to stronger dispersion forces. By the way, nitrogen would be the weakest one because nitrogen has the lowest molar mass. Now, another way you can uh, look at this uh, question is by looking at the appearance of the different substances. So for example, fluorine at room temperature is a gas. So it's this greenish looking gas, that's fluorine. So at room temperature, it exists as a gas, whereas iodine at room temperature exists as a solid, shown here. Now chlorine at room temperature exists as a gas, that's why it's in a flask. And bromine at room temperature exists as a liquid. 
Next we have nitrogen. And what you see is liquid nitrogen coming out of the container. As soon as it comes out of the container, it vaporizes and forms gas. So at room temperature, nitrogen is a gas. If you ever get the chance to feel liquid nitrogen, it's actually pretty cool. When it drops on your fingers, it's kind of a silky uh, feeling. It's pretty neat. You think it's water, but it's not water. And it evaporates as soon as it or vaporizes as soon as it touches your skin. So if we were to ask based on the physical states, which one would have the strongest intermolecular forces? Well, again, it would be iodine because iodine is a solid at room temperature and the others are gases and liquid. So when you look at different compounds and you see at room temperature, hey, this is a gas, this is a solid, then the one that's a solid is going to have stronger intermolecular forces than the one that is a gas. And so here iodine would have the, again, the strongest intermolecular forces. So with nonpolar molecules, we look at the molar mass to determine which one has the stronger intermolecular forces. But the question arises is what happens when the two nonpolar molecules have similar or the same molar mass uh, between them and they're both nonpolar. And this happens when we have what are, what are called constitutional isomers. So constitutional isomers have the same chemical formula, therefore they have the same molar mass. So when we have the compounds that are nonpolar with the same molar mass, we have to look at the second criteria in determining which one has the stronger intermolecular forces. So again, with nonpolar molecules, the first criteria is molar mass. If that is inconclusive, we go to what is referred to as the molecular shape. So again, you start with the first criteria, molar mass. If that's the same, then you go to the molecular shape. So what's shown below is our two constitutional isomers, n-pentane and neopentane. And you'll notice that they both have the same number of carbon and hydrogen atoms. So since they have the same number of carbon and hydrogen atoms, they have this, the same molar mass. We can't distinguish the strength of the intermolecular forces based on the molar mass. So therefore, since we can't discern it from the molar mass, we go to the molecular shape. And the more spread out the molecule is, the stronger the intermolecular forces will be because it can make more contact with the molecule. So something that is more spread out versus something that is compact, the one that's more spread out would have the uh, stronger intermolecular forces, again, when the molar masses are the same. So here in pentane has stronger intermolecular forces because it's more spread out, it's a chain whereas neopentane is more compact, it has weaker intermolecular forces. And so the, you can tell this by looking up the boiling points. The boiling point of n-pentane is 36.1 Celsius and neopentane is 9.5 degrees Celsius. But again, this criteria is only when the first criteria molar mass is inconclusive. Likewise, with polar molecules, the first criteria is the dipole moment. The second criteria is molar mass. And the third criteria is molecular shape. Because all molecules whether they're nonpolar or polar, have dispersion forces. It's just that with polar molecules, dispersion forces are not the major intermolecular force. The dipole dipole is. So for polar molecules, if you can't determine which one has the stronger dipole moment, then you would look at which one had the larger molar mass. 
If that is still questionable, then you look at the molecular shape. So this is kind of like the hierarchy of what you ask yourself when you're trying to determine which one has the stronger intermolecular forces or the higher boiling points. Now, again, you have to be comparing similar uh, molecules. And I'll explain what that is in just a second. And so this is just showing you an illustration of how molecular shape dictates the strength of the uh, intermolecular forces. So here we have uh, butane, isobutane, butanol, 2-butanol, and isobutanol. And so butane, if I draw it the shorthand way, is just a C4H10. And what you're looking at is the electron density region of the molecule. So the red signifies negative. Let me do a different color. The red color signifies negative and the blue color signifies uh, positive. So what you're seeing here, there's not really a good distinction between the negative and positive regions. It's kind of mixed. But when we go to isobutane, which looks something like that, C4H10, now it's more compact. So you see it has a lower boiling point because again, the more compact it is, the less contact points the weaker the intermolecular forces. So butane and isobutane are constitutional isomers. They have the same chemical formula, just different structure. And since the isobutane is more compact, it's going to have a lower boiling point than butane. Now, as we go from butane to butanol, You see, we've added an OH group to it. Now we've gone from butane, which is nonpolar, to butanol, which is polar. Likewise, we go from something that just has dispersion and butane to something that now has hydrogen bonding. And notice the significant increase in the boiling point when we go from dispersion to hydrogen bonding. It jumps over 100 degrees uh, improvement in the boiling point. Because now hydrogen bonding is a stronger intermolecular force. Therefore, it has higher boiling point. Now, 2-butanol means that the OH is not at the end anymore. It's on the second carbon. So now what happens? Is since it's in the middle of the molecule, it doesn't make as good hydrogen bonding as the uh, one butanol. So this is determined by the difference or the lowering of the boiling point. Because now that hydrogen, that OH is kind of stuffed between these big bulky alkyl groups, so it's harder for it to make a hydrogen bond with a neighbor molecule. One second, looking something up. And lastly, we have isobutanol. And so what that looks like, is something like this. So it's isobutane with an alcohol group. 
off of one of the carbons. And so here, this is a little bit better at hydrogen bonding than 2-butanol because you see an increase in the boiling point. But again, it's not as good as having the OH group at the end. So its boiling point is still less than 1-butanol. Because again, it's a little bit crowded with these big bulky alkyl groups around it to kind of hinder its ability to hydrogen bond. So again, the ability of the OH group to make hydrogen bonding, or the ease at which it makes hydrogen bonding, plays a significant role in determining the strength of the hydrogen bond. So when you start moving this OH group around in the molecule, you'll start uh, changing the effectiveness of the hydrogen bond. So here's another one, we have propane, propanol and isopropanol. So to show you this, propane, of course, is just C C3H8. It's, it's a nonpolar compound. It has a very low boiling point because it's very weak intermolecular interactions. Then we go to propanol, which is a hydroxyl group at the end of the propane chain. Here you see the boiling point increases dramatically because again we're going from a nonpolar to polar compound. In addition, now we have hydrogen bonding that occurs in that molecule. Now when we go to isopropanol, which looks like this, by moving that alcohol group from the end to the middle of the molecule, now you're weakening the effectiveness of the hydrogen bonding ability. And this is shown by the lowering of the boiling point. So again, by moving the OH group around, you can manipulate how effectively something can uh, hydrogen bond. So here's kind of a flow chart on how we should look at uh, the interacting particles when we're trying to determine the intermolecular forces present. So the first thing you want to ask yourself, are there ions present or not? If there's ions present, it's one of two types. Either it's going to only have ionic bonding or it's going to have, if it has a polar molecule present as well, it's going to have ion dot. So to show you the distinction, if you see something written as NaCl solid, this would only have ionic bond. But if you see something written as NaCl aqueous, this would be, for example, ion dipole, because aqueous infers that it's in solution. So those are the two things. If you have ions present, typically it's going to be ionic bonding, it's just a solid. If it's an aqueous, that means it's in water, or it could be any polar solvent like methanol, ethanol, whatever, it's going to be ion dipole. Now, if there's no ions present, the first thing you have to discern is whether it's polar or nonpolar. So we're looking at the geometry of the atoms and the molecule, looking at the types of atoms present, you can determine whether something is polar or nonpolar. Now, if you have a collection of a polar and a nonpolar molecule, then it can only be dipole induced dipole. So if you have two different molecules and one is polar, one is nonpolar, then it has to be dipole induced dipole. If it's just a nonpolar compound, then it's only dispersion forces present. If it's a polar compound, then you have to ask the question, is hydrogen bonding present? If yes, then hydrogen bonding is the intermolecular force. If no, then it's just dipole dipole. And so this is determining the major intermolecular force present in a molecule. You have other minor intermolecular forces, but this helps you determine what's the major 
intermolecular forces. And as it says on the bottom, dispersion forces are all present, whether it's polar or nonpolar. Just in polar compounds, it's not the major intermolecular force. So here we have a practice, uh, a question we want to know which of the following would have the greatest dipole moment, aka which would have the, would be the most polar compound. So we have propane, dimethyl ether, acetyl nitrile, butadiene, and acetyl aldehyde. And these are all relatively similar uh, molar masses. And so what we can do is if we look at the, well, first off, before we move any further, when we say greatest dipole moments, there's already two of these that we can disregard. Because two of these are nonpolar molecules and they would have a zero dipole moment. So those two that we can disregard are propane and butadiene. As you see, propane and butadiene only have <clears throat> carbon hydrogen bonds, so they're nonpolar. The other three are polar molecules. So we have to look at this and see which one of these would be the one with the greatest dipole moment. So the, the one that you can really distinguish where the positive and negative charge is. And if we take a look at the electron density plot of this, it looks like this. So again, the red region signifies negative, the blue region signifies positive. So propane, we know we can disregard and uh, butadiene. Now, if we look at dimethyl ether, we see here's the negative charge, but then all of this is positive charge. So it's not very well defined. There's just a little bit of negative charge and a lot of positive charge surrounding. So this tells you it's a very weak dipole mode. Next we go to acetyl nitrile. Here we have the nitrogen negative, and then on the other end, we have the hydrogens, which gives it its positive. So you see here, the dipole moment is very well defined in the molecule. We have a negative side and we have a positive side. Likewise, with acetaldehyde, again, the dipole is not very well developed because this is the positive end. This is a negative end. While this dipole moment is a little bit better defined than the one in dimethyl ether, the one in acetyl nitrile is very well defined because you have clearly a negative side and a positive side. So acetyl nitrile would have the greatest dipole moment. Notice we're saying greatest dipole moment, not, not anything to do with uh, boiling point or intermolecular forces yet. We're just looking at the uh, dipole moment. Now let's take a look at another example. So here we have a compound. We want to know what type of intermolecular force or what's the main intermolecular force uh, for this compound. And so this compound, if you're interested, is called an aldehyde, a type of organic compound. And we have to determine what's the main intermolecular force on it. So when you look at the compound, you'll notice there's no metal ions, so there's no ions present. Since there's no ions present, we can go ahead and disregard B and C. Because ionic or ion dipole means we have ions present, so there's no ions present. Secondly, we can disregard covalent because covalent bonding is not an intermolecular force, it's an intramolecular force. So now we're narrowed it down to dispersion, dipole-dipole, 
and hydrogen bond. Now for determining if something is dispersion, we look at this and we see, is it polar or nonpolar? And you'll notice here that the carbon oxygen has a dipole moment because oxygen is more electronegative than carbon. So this is a polar molecule. So it would not be dispersion. So now we have to distinguish between dipole, dipole and hydrogen bonding. So we look at this oxygen. Do we see a hydrogen attached to this oxygen? And the answer is no. Now this hydrogen here is attached to a carbon, it doesn't count. Looking at this oxygen, since there's no hydrogen attached to it, we cannot have hydrogen bonded. So therefore, the only intermolecular force we can have is dipole-dipole. So it's a polar molecule with no hydrogen bonding. It's a dipole-dipole intermolecular force. Let's look at one more. So here we have this diagram. We want to know what's the major intermolecular force present. So again, we look, we see we have a compound and an ion. So it's going to be something involving ions since we have an ion and a compound shown in this picture. So we can go ahead and get rid of dipole dipole, get rid of dispersion, get rid of hydrogen bonding, dipole induced dipole, and of course covalent bonding, which is an intramolecular force. So again, the reason we could do that is because a metal ion is present. It's going to be either ion dipole or ion induced dipole. Now, if it's ion dipole, that means we have a polar molecule. If it's ion induced dipole, it's nonpolar. And so when you look at this compound, you see that there's a carbon fluorine bond which has a dipole moment, but on the opposite end is another carbon fluorine bond with the same dipole moment. So all the dipole moments on the carbon fluorine bonds cancel out. The carbon nitrogen, excuse me, the carbon iodine bond is also a nonpolar bond, just like the carbon carbon. So since it's nonpolar, there's no dipole moment. So this is a nonpolar molecule. So since it's a nonpolar molecule, it would be ion-induced dipole. So here we have a question that says, select the two molecules that are polar. So we're given a list of molecules. We want to go through and select which one of these are polar. And it's telling us there's two of these that are polar molecules. So first thing we want to look for is, are there any that just contain carbon and hydrogen? So as you look through, you'll see that C only contains sticks. So if something only contains sticks, it only has carbon and hydrogen present. So we know for a fact that C is not polar because it only contains carbon and hydrogen atoms. Now, if we look at A, here we have nitrogen. But sometimes people forget with nitrogen, when you have free bonds to nitrogen, this is similar to the structure that everybody knows, that is ammonia. So when nitrogen has three bonds, it's understood that a lone pair of electrons are also there. Just like in ammonia, we have a lone pair of electrons. <clears throat> Whenever you see that the uh, nitrogen has three single bonds around it, or three bonds in general, it's going to have a lone pair of electrons on it as well. So it's understood that when you see a nitrogen with three bonds, it's going to have a lone pair attached to it as well. And so what happens is, since this nitrogen has a lone pair of electrons and they don't cancel out, A is a polar 
molecule because that lone pair of electrons don't cancel out. So there's some, there's a dipole moment that forms between the nitrogen and the lone pair. So A is a polar compound. Now, if we go to B, B, you see we have a lot of carbon and hydrogens, and then we have this bromine at the end. And so one interesting thing about bromine is that it has the same electronegativity as carbon. So this carbon-bromine bond is a nonpolar bond. And since it's nonpolar, that means that all of these bonds in this molecule are nonpolar. So B is a nonpolar compound. Again, carbon and bromine have similar electronegativities. Now moving to D. Well, D has a polar bond, the boron fluorine bond. But since it's trigonal planar geometry, anytime you have trigonal planar geometry, and you have the same atoms on the outside of the molecule, all the dipoles are going to cancel out. So this is a nonpolar molecule. Because again, it's trigonal planar, dipoles cancel out. Because again, the fluorines, the atoms on the outside of the molecule are all the same. Next, we have tellurium uh, tetrafluoride. And when we look at the Lewis structure of tellurium tetrafluoride, you see we have this lone pair of electrons here. And since it's only one lone pair of electrons, they won't cancel out. So tellurium tetrafluoride is a polar molecule. And then lastly, we have what's called a geometric isomer. And in the geometric isomer, we have cis and trans. This is the trans version because the OHs are on opposite sides. And since they're on opposite sides, the dipole moments cancel out. So this is a nonpolar molecule. The cis version, where the OHs are on the same side, so they're both pointing up, is polar. So typically, when you have cis and trans geometric isomers, the cis is polar. The trans is nonpolar because in the trans state, the dipoles cancel out. So here we have an example which of the following would exhibit dipole induced dipole intermolecular forces. So when we look at this, it says dipole induced dipole. So for dipole induced dipole, we're going to need two different types of molecules. So dipole refers to a polar molecule because dipole dipole interactions and induced dipole refers to a nonpolar molecule. So what we need is we need some combination that shows a polar molecule and a nonpolar molecule together. That's going to give us a dipole induced dipole intermolecular force. So if we go through, we look at A. A contains sodium chloride and water. Well, sodium chloride is ionic. Water is polar. So this will not give us dipole induced dipole. This will give us ion dipole. So it can't be A. If we go down and look at C, C contains propanol and uh, two butamine, I would say, or it has an amine as well. And so since it has an alcohol and an amine, both of these are polar compounds. And what's interesting about both of these is that they both have hydrogen bonding. So since they're both polar, they both have hydrogen bonding, they would not exhibit dipole-induced dipole intermolecular interactions. Next we go to B, we have benzene and we have dichlorobenzene or paradichlorobenzene to be exact. 
And if you look at benzene, it only has sticks, aka carbon and hydrogen bonds. So benzene is nonpolar. Because again, it only shows sticks, which means it only has carbon and hydrogen bonds. Now, paradichlorobenzene, there is a dipole moment between the carbon and the chlorine, but since they're on opposite sides, they cancel out. So since the dipoles cancel each other out, this is a nonpolar molecule. So since it's two nonpolar molecules, you just exhibit dispersion forces here. So it won't be D. Well, now by process of elimination, it has to be D, but let's explain why it's uh, D. So in D, the first example, or the first molecule only has sticks or lines. Since it only has sticks or lines, this tells you it only has carbon hydrogen bonds. So this is a nonpolar molecule. Now if we look at the second one. The second one has sticks, but off of one of the sticks, we have a fluorine. So since we have a chain and there's a heteroatom off of it that's polar, there's a dipole moment. So this becomes a polar molecule. So D is the one that would exhibit a dipole induced dipole interaction because it contains a polar molecule and a nonpolar molecule. 